The Sennheiser Ambio Soundbar Plus is a 7.1.4 channel soundbar with Dolby Atmos, DTSX and MPEG-H audio support. In the UK it can be found for £1,300 and in the US $1,500. Now I also have the Ambio Subwoofer that can be found for an additional £500 in the UK and $600 in the US. In this review you can see if the standalone or indeed the entire system is worth its price tag and furthermore how it compares to some of its rivals. So to kick things off I do want to quickly touch upon its design and here the dimensions will be on your screen. Now this is of importance because Sennheiser's first soundbar, which is called the Ambio Soundbar Max at the time of review, is a pretty chunky soundbar to say the least. Now thankfully that's not the case with the Soundbar Plus and therefore should fit on most sort of TV cabinets or of course you can wall mount it, although you'll have to purchase the wall mounting kit separately. Now in my case I've got it on a cabinet in front of a 55 inch TV and I have no such problems when it comes to visibility of the lower portion of my screen. Now as for its design, the soundbar itself is pretty stylish, at least in my opinion. It has got a fabric material that stretches from the front and the sides and then this is then protected by another layer which is hard, therefore protecting the drivers that are comprised within. Similarly, the same could be said about the upward firing drivers, although you will not find a fabric material over here. As for the subwoofer itself, it is pretty stylish and sleek and it does also have that mesh type of finish at the top, therefore matching the main soundbar unit. Now for you to control the soundbar, there's some touch sensitive buttons found at the top of the main unit and I'm never fond of them because I would have much preferred physical buttons as it prevents mistouch operation. Of course, you can control the soundbar from afar with the bundled remote, which feels pretty premium and hefty and gives you the right sort of settings that you need. Speaking of your settings, you have got a plethora of them via the app and the smart control app provides a lot of different options. First off, you've got the ability to adjust the volume on the fly and also change the input. Then you've got the Ambio, which you can enable or disable and go straight into an Ambio demo directly from Sennheiser. Then you've got the different sound modes, which I'll touch upon later, but in my case, I actually preferred using the music one. Now each sound mode can be individually set in terms of edited. And here you've got the ability to adjust the Ambio level, light, regular or boost. And also each one has got a four band EQ, which is certainly appreciated and certainly does stand out in comparison to some of its competitors. Aside from that, you've got night mode and voice enhancement, which can be enabled or disabled. Now you can see at the bottom over here you've got system calibration and yes indeed this has got built-in microphones which allows you to calibrate to your own room's acoustics which is very much good. Now here you have got a network tab which gives you Wi-Fi, Ethernet and Bluetooth settings. Then in terms of audio you can again see the calibration and if for example your furniture has changed you can do another calibration. As for the center settings this is very much applicable to multi-channel audio or indeed object-based audio allowing you to adjust the center volume. Then aside from this, you have got the subwoofer. Now, of course, if you have got the subwoofer, you can enable or disable it. I don't know why you'd ever want to disable it, but you've got the ability to do that and also adjust the volume, which is of course a bit more important in terms of your room's acoustic. And in my case, I left it at zero dB because I felt it was pretty good at that level. Now, I really do love this codec tab because it actually shows you what's playing and how many channels are being in use. In this respect, some terrestrial HD television is being played and you can see Dolby Digital is currently in use. You can enable or disable these options, although all of them I wouldn't actually suggest using, but of course you can play around with it to see what actually works best for you. Now as for the input, you can adjust the lip sync delay or leave it on auto, adjust the input names and also enable or disable for example the CEC control. As for the user interface, you can also enable or disable the LEDs altogether, which is very good, and also the sound feedback. Now aside from that, you do also have the system tab, whereby you can check for firmware updates, which is very much pivotal for most products these days, whereby this does support OTA firmware updates, and also you can adjust the soundbar name, go back into the subwoofer setting that I showed before, or indeed I'll completely do a reset. As for the services, very handy to have over here, whereby you've got Google Chromecast, Tile Connect, and AirPlay. But of course, if you click the Add Services, you can see there's a few more, for example, Google or Alexa, and you've also got AirPlay as well. Now for you to connect up to the app, the soundbar must support Wi-Fi and indeed it does. Here it'll go for the 2.4 and 5 GHz frequencies. 
Now, aside from this, you do also have Bluetooth, although the SPC and AC codecs are supported only. So I'd only use it sparingly, at least if you do not want the utmost audio quality. If you do, then the soundbar does support Chromecast, AirPlay 2, UPnP, and also Tidal Connect, and also Spotify Connect, all of which are certainly appreciated and therefore allows you to play high resolution files over Wi-Fi. Now for you to connect up to your television, you'll want to go over a wired connection. And here you have got an optical port whereby it supports up to a sampling rate of 192 kilohertz. But of course, you might want to opt for the better connection and that is HDMI. Here the eARC standard is in use, but of course it's backwards compatible to the ARC standard. And therefore, if you have an older television, you'll don't have to worry about it in terms of compatibility. The only worth mentioning over here is that eARC provides uncompressed Dolby Atmos data whereas ARC does not. Now aside from this you have got two HDMI 2.0 inputs which is quite a shame because modern day consoles cannot be plugged in directly into the soundbar therefore being the soundbar does not pass through 4K 120 and rather is capped to 4K 60 which should suffice for example for a 4K Blu-ray player. Now aside from these, you do also have an auxiliary input via RCA, which is certainly handy for more legacy devices. And then you also have a subwoofer output via a mono RCA. Now here, this can be useful if you want to reduce the latency to the wireless subwoofer, although I did not incur any sort of problems, but it might be of importance for hardcore gamers out there. Or of course, if you have your own subwoofer unit, then you can plug it in via the mono RCA and not have to worry about purchasing, let's say, the Sennheiser Ambio Sub. So with all of that out of the way, let's get onto an audio demo. Now it's not gonna be ideal because it's coming over YouTube and using my microphone, so it's not gonna give you a lifelike experience, but it'll give you a bit of a taster. First off, I'll be going through the different modes that the soundbar offers via Priya track, which is titled Like Me. And then I'll be enabling and disabling the subwoofer in order to comment on it via Miles Kundra's track, which is titled Pollution. And then I'll also be going onto the voice enhancement feature, enabling and disabling it on a piece to camera where I'll be presenting the MG4 EV on Totally EV. So make sure you check the annotations on your screen to understand how the soundbar or indeed the the system is currently running. segment fully electric vehicle from the Chinese automaker. Indeed, it's competing with the likes of the Cooper Bourne, VW ID3, Nissan Leaf, Renault Zoe, among a few others. And it's also the third installment in the EV range, whereby it comes in after the success of the ZS EV and the MG5 EV. Now, despite being the newest addition to the fleet, it's actually one of the cheapest. 
So with the audio demos out of the way, I should just quickly mention the soundbar setup. And here it has got two four inch woofers and seven two inch full range drivers, tallying up to nine drivers in total. It's got 400 watts of RMS power, at least rated by the manufacturer, and has got a frequency range that goes from 38 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. Now as for the wireless subwoofer, it has a singular long throw upward firing 8 inch driver which on its own is capable of producing a whopping 350 watts of RMS power and that is also due to the fact that it has a built in class D amplifier. As for its frequency range, it goes from 80 hertz all the way down to 27 hertz. Now specs aside, let me get onto my subjective opinion and here I want to talk about its sub bass extension. Now the subwoofer itself is absolutely spectacular. It's by far the best subwoofer that I've ever seen included with a soundbar. Indeed, not only does it extend up to 27 Hertz, but it also has a fantastic crossover with the main soundbar unit and also has got perfect quality. Indeed, that long throw eight inch driver is absolutely exquisite, be it when I was listening back to music or watching movies. Now, oddly, you can even pair up to four separate Ambio subs to the soundbar. So therefore, if you're an absolute bass head and you've got the budget to spare, then you can pair up up to four different subwoofers and therefore get that real cinematic feel. Now, aside from the subwoofer, if we were to take it out of the equation, the main soundbar unit does extend down to 38 hertz, which is actually somewhat on par with some of its competitors, which actually offer a dedicated subwoofer unit, which only extends down to around 35 to 34 hertz. So yes, even without the subwoofer unit, the main soundbar standalone unit is still pretty impressive when it comes to delivering that low end prowess. But of course, will be further bolstered if you get the wireless sub that Sennheiser offers. Now this does perfectly bring me onto its mid bass presence and with a little bit of EQ through the app it was done to perfection, at least to my ears, both in terms of quantity and quality. Indeed it allowed me to have an exciting sort of tone when I was listening back to my favourite tracks, watching movies or even YouTube videos. Speaking of which, if you're liking this one, definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification, all of which are greatly appreciated. Now this does actually bring me on to one of its biggest flaws and that is the lower mids. Indeed here the lower mids just felt far too pushed back and recessed which actually came to a surprise for me because Sennheiser was really known for having that forward sounding mid range presence but unfortunately that was not the case. The lower mids could be EQ'd to a certain degree via the app, however doing so will take away from the overall accuracy. So I didn't really want to add too much to the lower mids and therefore take away from the overall accuracy and just had to contemplate having a V-shaped sound signature. Now the upper mids do extend a little bit better and can be EQ'd to a certain degree a little bit more than the lower mids and therefore can bring up certain vocals. Now for you to really counteract this, you'll want to enable the voice enhancement feature. So much so that I actually had this enabled permanently when I was using the soundbar for my own means. So for example, when I was watching videos or whatever it might be that I was doing, I wanted to have the voice enhancement feature enabled because the vocals really came out to the foreground rather than being pushed down to the background. Now this does have a hindrance in terms of the other frequency ranges, but the overall bolstered sound that I was getting in terms of the mids was certainly appreciated with the voice enhancement feature. Now as for the highs, they do extend relatively well, but can't quite compete with some other flagship soundbars out there on the market. One that comes to mind that I recently reviewed was the Samsung HWQ990B. With its dedicated tweeter setups, it just felt a lot more zingy and gave me that sort of toe tapping feeling. The same couldn't be quite said about the Sennheiser Ambio Soundbar Plus. Now speaking about one of its competitors, I should also mention the different sound modes. See often I like using let's say a smart or adaptive sound mode, but alas I couldn't do this with this Sennheiser soundbar because the adaptive mode or even the movie preset added a slight little bit of an odd reverb, which took away from the overall accuracy and wasn't exactly how the artist or indeed let's say the film director was intending it to actually be like. As a result, I had to use the music preset predominantly for me to get a somewhat lifelike and accurate reproduction. Now on that note, it does perfectly bring me on to the Dolby Atmos demo. I'll be playing back Transformers Age of Extinction. I'll also be enabling and toggling the Ambio preset. So hopefully you can hear the differences when that's enabled and disabled. <laughs> I 
underestimate, okay? I'm Shane, and I'm completely... And I am not talking to you! Drive the car! Watch out, watch out! Now, yet again, an audio demo over YouTube is not ideal. So here, in terms of my subjective opinion, the Ambio preset that was enabled really bolstered the overall experience that I was able to attain with this soundbar. And it's certainly something that I left on permanently when I was consuming content. Now, as for the metadata support, it has got Dolby Atmos, DTSX, and also got MPEG H audio, and also 360 degree audio if you have that supported somewhere. Now, in this respect, I felt that with Dolby Atmos, which is what I was able to demo, it really did bolster the overall capabilities of the soundbar. Indeed, the four upward firing drivers really came to life and gave me a bit more of that room feeling experience. However, it didn't quite give me the cinematic experience in comparison to some of its near-priced rivals. Indeed, over here, some of the flagship soundbars that I've heard to date provide rear speakers or indeed a multitude of configuration in terms of the main soundbar unit with forward, upward, sideward, and front sideward drivers, which really gave me that cinematic experience. Yet again over here, the Sennheiser soundbar couldn't quite compete with some of its main rivals and it left me a little bit disheartened even when I was consuming Dolby Atmos content. So with all of that in mind, can I see myself recommending the Sennheiser Ambio Soundbar Plus? Well, given the price point it comes in at and the alternatives out there already on the market, the answer is an honest no. I just feel that some of the alternatives out there will deliver a much more cinematic experience and or offer a subwoofer within the box and indeed come in at a cheaper price point, making them a far easier recommendation. Now, don't get me wrong, the Sennheiser soundbar is actually pretty impressive and the subwoofer is absolutely spectacular. I just can't see myself shelling out that much amount of money when I could buy some alternatives out there and still give me a phenomenal experience and if not a better experience throughout the frequency range. Now I'd be curious to know what you make of Sennheiser's latest soundbar down in the comments section below and if you've liked this independent detail review definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification. Where I can't stress it enough it certainly is appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such I'll be totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.